Heart Health with Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. As you can see, we are live on location, and I've got Dr. Katie Sharkey with me. Thank you for joining today. Thanks for having me, Kate. Sleep expert and wears many hats. Associate Professor of Medicine, uh, Human Behavior and Psychiatry. Also, Assistant Dean for Women in Medicine and Science and a practicing physician. So very important question for you, when do you sleep? Oh, I sleep pretty well. I make it a priority and I know that my brain works better and that I function better and I can do all those jobs and wear all those hats if I get enough sleep. So I do try to make it a priority. And I also, if I'm not getting enough sleep one night, I try to hit the hay a little earlier than the next night so that I can make it up a little bit. So speaking of hitting the hay, we are live in East Providence at Brown University's brand new, just weeks open, new mm -hmm. sleep labs. And you're here with a number of uh, physicians who are overseeing these studies. So I think folks have heard of sleep studies, might have taken part of sleep studies, but what takes place here specifically, Dr. Sharkey, that you are looking for in your research? You know, who are your patients? Who's coming into the lab? And then what does it look like when you come in for a sleep study? So that's a great question. And I would love to demystify that if I can for the people who might be needing a sleep study and aren't sure what it would be. So generally, we see patients for two reasons. Either they're too sleepy during the day or they're not sleeping well enough at night. Okay. And if we suspect a sleep disorder that we can detect with a sleep, an overnight sleep study in the lab, then we have them come in here. And so people, you know, it's not the night, oftentimes people think that they're coming in to see us and that they're gonna have to sleep here that night, but mm. that's not how it goes down. We okay. schedule it according to their schedule and we're open seven nights a week so people can come in and then, um, we attach electrodes on their brain to measure their EEG, so their brain waves, and then we measure respirations and heart um, uh, rhythms and leg movements, all the different physiological signals, and so that way we can detect if there's a sleep disorder. So we will know if their sleep stages are normal, we'll know if they're stopping breathing during sleep, which is a part of a disorder called sleep apnea. Mm. We'll know if they have something called periodic limb movement disorder, which is a disorder where people kick their legs like hundreds of times. You know, wow. I read one the other day, 535 times. And if the brain is waking up all those times, people don't feel well rested the next day. So they come in and get that done, and then we have a better idea of maybe why they're not sleeping well at night or why they're so tired during the day. So that's, and, the, and again, in terms of procedures, you come, we have you change into your own comfy jammies. We usually tell people to bring their own pillows, even though our pillows are fab, because everybody <laughs> likes their own pillow. Yes. And then, um, you know, there's a big TV that the viewers can't see right now, but um, they are welcome to, you know, go to bed at their regular time, and then we just wake them up in the morning and let them go home. So, so if you can see a little bit behind me here, I mean, it looks like, it looks like a hotel room. Yeah. Um, they've got lights, they've got TV, they've got comfy chairs. But just off screen, again, are those measurements that show, again, all those things that you're looking for as well. So my next question is if people think they have a sleep disorder, you mentioned a couple of those kind of trigger points, mm -hmm. both how they're doing in the nights and throughout mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. When do people oftentimes come in and then say, I'm at that level, I really should see a doctor about my sleep? Yeah. So I think that their sleep affects so many different physiologic conditions that I mean, there are obvious things like I'm falling asleep at work, I am worried I'm gonna crash my car, you know, those are red flags and they should absolutely get taken care of right away. But sometimes it's more subtle. Sometimes it's I have depression and it's not getting better. Sometimes it's my high blood pressure is now I'm on four medicines and my doctor still can't get it down or I'm doing my best with my diabetes and it's not getting better. So the neurons that control in our brain, the nerve cells that control sleep and eating are right next to each other in the brain. Okay. And so... Um, it can it, sleep bad sleep or fragmented sleep can have an effect on appetite obesity there's a high correlation between being overweight and having sleep issues so it's a myriad it's everything from you know are you crying all the time to are do you have atrial fibrillation and your heart might stop like the, and and soup to nuts everything in between so a lot of your research again at the Warren Alpert Medical School here at Brown Medicine in East Providence focuses a lot on women. Yeah. Now I know that your focus oftentimes is on postpartum sleeping mm -hmm. patterns and I think folks I've talked to have said, is that an oxymoron? Because right. usually <laughs> your sleep is probably so disjointed but uh, th 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 that must be such a plethora of uh, evidence and, and research to be conducted because 
I'm sure every woman's unique and it's so difficult after having a child. Sure. So thanks for asking me that because I think this is another like myth buster thing about sleep is um, people say, you know, patients who I've seen will say, well, the doctor just said to me, just wait, you know, if they're sleeping, tra- having trouble during pregnancy, just wait till you have the baby, then it's going <laughs> to get worse. And, and so we really decided with colleagues um, at the Miriam, so Terry Perlstein, Carmen Monzon, these are um, Ellen Flynn, are my, these are all physicians, psychiatrists who are my colleagues on this study. And we really said, let's be, let's take a better look at what we can be doing for sleep in these women who are having depression okay. during pregnancy and to try to get things better before mm. postpartum instead of just sort of fear mongering that it's going to get worse once the baby comes, kind of shore things up. And, you know, it's interesting to study this group because there's really little attention paid Mm. to them. There's a lot of pressure on women to just feel so awesome when they're pregnant and postpartum, even though there's so many changes. And sleep is fundamental to serving so many of those other things, whether it's bonding with the baby or feeling like your, you know, your family is coming together that you want it to. The other thing is women are not super excited necessarily to take medicines during mm. this time. And I, medicines are great. We use them all the time. I'm a psychiatrist and an internist by training. I love medicines. But women don't always want to take them while they're pregnant or breastfeeding. And so the, by manipulating their sleep a little bit, we can try to shore all that stuff up so that things like regulating your mood and, and bonding with the baby are a little bit easier. Um, so is that a myth? So are there medicines that are safe to take during pregnancy and after? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think um, that's another great question. It's it, for a long time, especially in research, uh, you know, pro- studying pregnant women, they're they are still a protected category of research, and I understand that, and mm. I think it's appropriate. Um, and you want to have um, good conversations with people about what they should take and not take. But we know that, for example, narcolepsy. It's a rare disorder but it's a um, neurologic disorder that causes extreme sleepiness um, in in the patients that have it, and they have intrusions of sleep into wakefulness. Mm. And so when you look at at it, it starts in the late teens, early 20s, at the right at the time where a lot of people want to grow their families. And if you look at women with narcolepsy, sort of not looking at any, just sort of naturalistically following them, Mm they tend to be older so they finally get diagnosed they get on a good regimen and then they're like oh, i'm not having a beat like well, i don't you know i'm worried about this so yeah. they tend to be a little bit higher risk okay um but it turns out that when those group that group was studied one of the things that most a lot of docs did was just take them down on their meds which makes no sense because then they're not appropriately treated mm. but the the fetus is still being exposed and so then you're like, you're not helping anybody. Mm. And in term, you know, you asked if other medicines were safe for a long time. It wasn't studied, but now we know there are many medicines, whether it's antidepressants or medicines for sleep that are safe for pregnancy and the postpartum period. And that the out, now we have enough data years out that we can look at like, you know, the kids in fifth grade. I mean, it's not like, oh, were they born okay? It's like, how'd they do on their PSATs? And still show that they were fine and yeah. that in fact they were better off than, than children who were raised in a household where mom had untreated depression. So in a way, you've got a suffering new mom mm. you've got who wasn't treated because she thought she was doing the right thing because mm. we didn't have enough data. Now we have the data that clearly shows better to be treated. But we're really excited about treating the sleep part of this because it's... It kind of it is a little subversive, right? Like instead of saying, "Well, just give it up," it's never you're never going to sleep again. <laughs> we sort of really try to shore up their sleep and teach them some basics. The other thing that happens with women when they're postpartum is their biological clock can get very messed up. So our internal clock, just like if um, you have jet lag or if you're a shift worker, um, the being up at night with the baby and getting light at a weird time when it's your brain thinks it's oh, night sure. and then it's like why am I getting this light Recavic. can can almost can cause like postpartum jet lag mm-hmm. and so that's a big part of the study but I enjoy that I enjoy working with that population and they've historically been understudied um, so we really want to start to concentrate on them and let's talk a little bit about the role of technology in sleep oh, because sure. we're seeing a lot at apps, uh, things that are mm-hmm. trying to, you know, 
tap into the, your, your bodily functions. Mm -hmm. And you've been quoted in national news on this as well. Again, we're seeing it. What should folks know if they're out there, they might see an ad, they might say, well, that might be great to know when I should wake up or how I'm feeling after yeah. X number of hours of sleep. You had some, and as we say, with the wearables, there's any number of devices out there that can keep track. But you've got um, some advice and some caution and yep. what to think about if you're looking at, perhaps looking at uh, going down that road. Yeah, so a uh, couple of things. One, we know that self-monitoring, whether we're trying to lose weight or get enough sleep, all that is great. So what you can't change if you don't know what the data are. Mm. But if you know, mm, I'm actually only spending six hours in bed per night, you know, can't slide between the sheets at midnight, get up at 5.30, keep doing that. I know why. If those people are sleepy, I know why. They're not getting enough sleep. So tracking your sleep time is, a, is not a bad idea if you're, if you're very sleepy during okay. the day. And I think that these wearables are great for that. The, um, they, this is also in a group of people, like you're not a kid anymore, you're a grown up and you're like, I don't have to eat broccoli if I don't want to, and I can have my own <laughs> bedtime. And people I think don't necessarily realize that they're, that how uh, they may be skimping on sleep. Mm. Um, and so I think it's really good for collecting those data about bedtime and wake time. The it, place where I would raise my first concern is that the algorithms are not one size fits all you know so the typical thing for me is I see you know a postmenopausal lady she's using this Fitbit she's I'm I always look I always want to have patients share their data with me and I'm always happy to look at it so I'm not trying to discourage that mm. either but you know they're so worried about what the app shows and I say do you think this algorithm was written for you <laughs> you know I mean it was written for you know the most generic. of those wearables mm. are for you know, younger people, you know, who are at, who are trying to count their steps and build their steps up, not to measure sleep in a 54-year-old lady having hot flashes every <laughs> night. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. the algorithms are, are definitely not one size fits all. And, and then the consequence of that, Kate, is that if somebody's looking at that um, app that's measuring the wearables data and it says, well, I'm getting all light sleep and I'm not getting any REM mm. sleep and I'm not getting any deep. And then that can perpetuate their own worry. So there, so I've seen that a lot. And in fact, one of my colleagues from Northwestern, doc, Dr. Sabra Abbott just published a case report of that's like, it's a, they want to propose a new sleep disorder called I'm spending too much time looking at my own data <laughs> and talking and, you know, um, that's talking myself into feeling worse than I do. They look at their app that decides how they're going to spend their day. Even if, you know, you should stretch and like, you know, have your coffee or your breakfast first and then decide how you feel. Can I say one more thing about, about technology? Because, you know, we're in this beautiful sleep lab. It's state of the art, but we now have the ability to measure at least for sleep apnea at home. And I think that's another important uh, thing, okay. sort of thing for people to know because, um, so we're talking about women's health. Mm. It's estimated 90% of women with sleep apnea are not diagnosed wow. because it was so much thought to be a men's disease. Mm. And then I think there's, oh, maybe our lights are going off here. <laughs> this time is, at the sleep lab. This is what's great about being in a sleep lab. So we're going to make sure we get lights right back. It's our mood light. And we'll be right back. So, and I'll just keep talking about yes. this technology. So the, um, the, it's not necessarily suspected in women. It can go undiagnosed in women. And, but now we have home monitors that monitor for sleep apnea at home. So not everyone in whom sleep apnea is, is suspected needs to come and sleep overnight in the sleep lab. And you know, it's great if they need the sleep lab, but if, but if that's a barrier to being evaluated, I absolutely want to send the message that we can send you, send you home, come during the day, meet with somebody, they'll teach you how to use it. You go home that night, sleep in your own bed, and at least we'll know if you have sleep apnea or not, which because it's so common, estimated 24% of men and 9% of women with a gender gap that, I mean, so if you're, if a guy's in a room with four people, three other guys, one of them has it, you know, if, it so that's a lot of people. And since it contributes to so many other um, comorbid conditions, mm. we really want to be treating that in people and the sleep, sleeping in, in a strange place overnight um, doesn't have to be a barrier to that evaluation. So let's talk a little bit about that. Wow, 90% of women with sleep apnea yeah. not diagnosed. Yeah. And I know your research has shown, and research has shown, 
Uh, it can manifest itself very differently in men and women. So, um, you know, talk a little bit about those symptoms, and then I, def- I want to get to the treatment side. As you said, you, you can find out about it at home, but again, being so common, mm-hmm. um, differences between men and women, and then what happens once they're diagnosed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sleep apnea was first had a treatment for it in 1986. You know, I was in high recent. school. It's super <laughs> Very recent. recent. So, and so, of course, when something's kind of a new syndrome, it's obviously diagnosed in the most severe people. And mm. so it was being diagnosed in people that were stopping breathing hundreds of times mm. a night. They, you know, my colleagues who who practiced during that time tell stories of like they'd come in the waiting room and the patient's lips would be blue because they had fallen asleep in the waiting room and then were were not breathing so the those most of your cases got picked up early and but over time it was really felt to be more of a man's disease Mm. and so it's a lot of things one snoring is a symptom i think that probably more female bed partners in heterosexual couples were more likely to say, honey, you're going to have snoring. Is it? I'm taking the kids. I'm going to my mom's, you know, or I'm, you're in the bed, the yeah. guest room. So I think it start, you know, that may, maybe women either were reluctant to say they were snorers or their husbands were reluctant to tell them or they just felt like they were not so um, proud of that symptom or what have you so I think snoring you know not be, being underreported or either to the patient or by the patient was one factor mm. and then um, it it appears that sleep apnea does manifest a little bit different in women than in men so okay. you know globally speaking this isn't the case for everybody but it looks like women's brains wake up more from sleep apnea when the throat closes the oxygen goes down and the brain wakes up and so women tend to have more of these brief arousals in the brain whereas men tend to have their oxygens drop a lot. Okay. So again, if somebody's in the hospital, they're they're not on a brain monitor necessarily, but they always you always have that pulse ox mm. on your finger. And so um, the manifestations are a little bit different. And then you can imagine the manifestations of oxygen being low is stuff like heart attacks or heart problems or stroke, mm. whereas the the symptom of getting your brain woken up 60 times a night is you cry all the time, you feel terrible, you're fatigued, you're exhausted. And then sleep apnea is not usually acute. You know what I'm saying? It's not like somebody didn't have it one day and then they get it the next day. Um, And so it happens at the time where you're raising kids and working and you're you're helping your parents and things are, you know, it's like it's insidious a little bit. Mm. And there's always a reason that you could be, that a woman could be tired (laughs) other than that she has sleep apnea. So, um... So, so I think that that's why the, the sex difference, that it, people didn't necessarily suspect it as early in women. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, no, I just want to know where things are at with treating sleep apnea. Right. So I will say we've come a long way. Um, there are, so CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure, which I'll explain how that works, is still the gold standard. So. Okay. When I'm talking about sleep apnea and the throat closing, I'm talking about the throat closing like right back if I said open and say ah, mm. we won't do that. But, um, and so the way that CPAP works is it pushes air, to, it's like a splint for your throat for, of air. So okay. you know when you go by the um, car dealer and there's that dancing guy, like the little dancing blow air guy, or if you have to blow a balloon up, and before you blow the globe of the balloon up, you have to get that stem to be full of air. Mm. So that's what CPAP does, is it pushes just enough air through that it props the throat open so that it can't close off. I will say that when that was first developed in 1986, it wasn't the greatest. They were loud. They had these big clunky masks. You know, now there's this little thing that goes under the nose and straps on the back. They're quiet. They're quieter than anybody's snoring for, you know, and so, and they have heated humidification. So they are, they are, people are comfortable with them. Um, so it really is a different machine than it was, you know, even five years ago. So that's still the gold standard. Um, as you can imagine, when this was first uh, discovered, people were like, let's have a surgical treatment. And so there are a lot of surgeries that don't work, like getting your uvula lasered out doesn't work that great. <laughs> um, tonsillectomy works well for some people. Okay. Um, there are other funny things that have been tried surgically, but I would say the, so, but for surgery, some people's, it is an option. Surgery is an option for some people. The surgeries that I think work are one, if someone is very overweight, like in the obesity category, mm. bariatric surgery works. So people who are, you know, hundred pounds overweight, if they lose that weight, then they will 
they, they could have a cure or a significant um, improvement in their sleep apnea. Another surgery that works is, um, especially for people with certain facial configurations is, they can actually go in and pull your jaw forward a little bit. And so if you can imagine, the th throat can't close off then um, because it, they move, they advance the jaw a little bit. That's a big surgery. Like you're eating through a straw for three months. <laughs> um, but I've had a few patients have that and it is effective. Um, and then there's a new device that's almost like if you can imagine a pacemaker that is put under the skin, the skin, but then it has a wire that goes to the um, to the muscle or to the nerve that uh, controls the tongue muscle, and it gets people. I'm not gonna stick my tongue out on live. <laughs> Go live. <laughs> but um, it has them protruded a little bit just while. So they you hit it to turn it on while you're sleeping. Okay. And then if you can imagine, like if you stick your tongue out, it feels a little bit more. Air, like air open yeah. in there and so then that that works I mean the surgeries are definitely I would say second line we're not you know I don't meet someone and say oh you have sleep apnea let's get you in the <laughs> OR you know that's but I think surgical options are good for some people and then some people can get treatment with posi body positioning some treat get um, people get treatment with different de dental devices that can pull their jaw forward sort of like the surgery only not permanent okay um, so there's a myriad of options and you know, and we and I always joke with my patients. Like, if my any of my patients see this, they'll say she really does say this. I always joke. Like, it's not like I'm house, you know. <laughs> like, oh, what could this be? You know, the, the, there's two seats in my office. The you know, the couple comes in. One of them's like, I have to listen to this snoring anymore. You know, it's not like I'm. Oh, what could this be? You know, it's not. We know it's sleep apnea, so we you know we have to do the test to prove it. But then really, I feel like where the art of this comes in, such as it were is about treating um, the um, patient individually and mm. figuring out what's gonna work for them. Because you know it's great to have a CPAP machine, but if you're never gonna wear it, then maybe the dental device is a better thing, or maybe we do need to have you see a surgeon. Does that make sense? So it's not a one-size-fits-all treatment. Mm. And then a lot of it is also about getting enough sleep, You know, not getting discouraged as you're get, you know, getting used to this. Um, but that's also why I love my job is because it's a, um, when we can treat sleep disorders, whether it's sleep apnea or get somebody who's, at, who's bad insomnia kind of back on track, um, they, it really makes like a day-to-day -day difference in how they feel. So that's a fun part. So while we're here in the sleep labs, let's talk a little bit about the Warren Alpert Medical School and Brown Medicine and what you're studying. It's here in 2019. We touched upon a little bit of the technology side of things. Um, what do you see as advances in treating sleep disorders? Um, you know, is, are, are things going to be different in 2025 and 2050 in terms of how we approach sleep, how disorders are treated, and, and what researchers are looking for currently, yeah. and how Brown plays a role in a, advancing the field? Yeah, you bet. So I think um, that's a great question. So for example, I was mentioning narcolepsy before, which is this disorder where people are extremely sleepy. And... There are new medicines coming out for that all the time. In fact, we are enrolling in a big clinical trial of a new, a new medication for narcolepsy. So that's really exciting um, to be able to offer patients the latest treatments. Mm. Um, and we are always keeping our eye on that to get, to get new pharmacologic treatments. I think that um, partly with the wearables and with sort of having pe big data or at least people's personalized data, I think we're gonna be a lot better at saying, hey, here should be your sleep time and your wake time. I also think, and you know, this is my opinion, I'm speaking just for myself, but um, I think there's a little backlash in some ways against meds, 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 and so many of, so many sleep problems can be, um, ameliorated in part with behavioral treatments and so I think the ability to um, get people to engage with behavioral treatments so the light therapy for example mm. I you know we are all are sleeping differently on June 22nd than we are on December 22nd the light dark cycle does affect us I think that we don't pay enough attention to stuff like that mm. and that's partly what this perinatal sleep study that we're doing is is if we can stabilize the light dark cycle so I think it, although that sounds a little <laughs> To, you know that we're gonna use light therapy but I really think we that 
we think, oh, you know, Siberian hamsters, they're subject to the light dark cycle and seasonal changes. I think we're going to learn a lot more about that. And part of what drove that, you know, throwback to Brown is basic scientists at Brown, um, like David Burson and Samar Hatter, um, who's now at NIH, they discovered brand new cells in the retina, the, the back of our eye, okay. that detect light levels that we didn't even know about. So you oh, know wow. about you know you learn in fifth grade rods, cones, color vision, <laughs> black and white vision. But, there's but now we know there's a cells. separate cell in the retina that was discovered at Brown by the gentleman that I mentioned um, that detects light levels and sends that signal to the brain. So I think you know there. Um, I was on a, re- a task force recently at NIH about the light stuff, and there's people who want to call it a photoceutical. So the idea that we could be timing light therapy differently. Um, I think, I think, um, treatment for sleep apnea is going to get better. I think that right now, um, there's a big change in the field to think about sleep apnea being more than one disorder. So Mm -hmm. just like people have, you know, there's different kinds of diabetes or there's different kinds of COPD and people have what we would call different phenotypes. So even though they have the same, the disorder has the same name, they don't really have the same subtype. We're starting to sort of tease that apart with sleep apnea. So, and the gender issue I mentioned is one of those examples. So, like, there's one group who has sleep apnea that their oxygen goes down all night, and they're and so they might ultimately need a different treatment than a subgroup of patients with sleep apnea who their brain is just waking up all night, but their oxygen stays at 95. So, I you know I think personalized inform um, medicine is also part of the future. Um, And then I I guess the last thing I would say that I think is sort of an innovation is there's really a move to to diversify the group of people who take care of people in in all clinical fields. So like I depend on my night technologists who stay up all night. They know a ton. And, And I think historically they've been like treated sort of like come in, do the sleep study, da da da. But, but when I have their clinical input, because they're the one that stayed up and watched this person all night long, th- I have like double the data. Mm. Does that make sense? That and so, sense. I do, so I do think that that's another place where Brown is leading is really um, in a team science and team clinical way to say that everybody on the healthcare team and everybody on the research team plays an important mm. role. And if everybody is be able to contribute regardless of rank or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's nice to have letters next to your name, but it's really nice to know your job and be, and be awesome at it. And the val- I feel like we're valuing that at, like, a higher level than we ever were, which is also really good for patients, you know? Well, I so appreciate your taking the time. If you didn't hear the introduction, uh, Dr. Sharkey is a physician, was just seeing a patient, got her in here to the sleep lab, again, to talk with viewers for here on Smart Health about the field of sleep research. Uh, you know, I so appreciate your taking the time, share some insights. And again, before we let you go, folks who are watching right now, and again, you mentioned it at the beginning, yep. think you might have sleep issues. What's that point at which you might need to see a physician? Yeah. So I think, you know, excessively sleepy during, it's not, it's not normal to not be able to stay up past dinner. Do you know, it's not, you know, it's not normal to be, to be struggling while you're driving your car. Um, and if I could say, you know, my big PSA is if you're sleepy while you're driving, pull over. Nobody who ever crashed their car by falling asleep behind the wheel thought that they were going to fall asleep. They all thought that they were going to make it the rest of the way. I'm, te- you know, it's Rhode Island, 10 minutes from home, <laughs> you know, right. And so they think they're going to be fine. I've got the window rolled down. So I think, you know, sleepy driving or, um, or, you know, staying up, feeling like your sleep is fragmented and it's up all night. And I guess they're turning the lights out because it's <laughs> time to go to sleep. <laughs> the lights out here in East Providence. Dr. Sharkey, thank you for thank taking you, the time Kate. to come on. And sleep thank well, you everybody. for visiting us here in the Sleep Labs and joining us for Smart Health with the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown and Brown Medicine. We'll see you back tomorrow on Go Local Live. Wish everyone a good evening. Catch us on golocalprov.com and on Facebook. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel.